You're listening to From the Chair, and I'm your host, Mike Hamilton. Join us each episode as we talk to athletic directors from across America. We're going to talk about topics like leadership, career development, issues of the day, and I can promise you we're going to have some fun along the way, too. So sit back, listen in, and let's dive in. Let's go. All right, welcome in. This should be a fun one today. Opportunity to visit with my longtime friend, colleague, co-pilot at the University of Tennessee, valued member of our uh, executive team, two-time National Athletic Director of the Year, also National Fundraiser of the Year, Wake Forest graduate, Tennessee graduate, John Curry. What's up, man? I, I got to clarify, Mike, I was never National Athletics Fundraiser of the Year. You were National Athletics Fundraiser of the Year, and our Executive Associate AD here at Wake Forest, Barry Faircloth, has been National uh, Fundraiser of the Year. Chad Weiber has been Fundraiser of the Year, but not me. Well, you know what? I, I guess I just assume that because you've done such a great job in, in development throughout your career. So, uh, hey, I, can an AD still get honored with that degree? I mean, that uh, I, honor? I, I think it's pretty specific that it has to be a, a member. I think I'm still an emeritus member of NADS. But uh, as Char the great Charlie Patterson always used to say, Mike, who gets the credit? The donor, the donor gets the credit. That's right. That's right. Charlie Patterson great fundraiser for so many years that John and I both had the pleasure to work with at Wake Forest for, for quite some time. Hey, John, so great article came out in the Wake Forest magazine over just the last little bit here for the spring edition of the Wake Forest magazine. And I actually tweeted it out last night because I thought it was such a great insight into who you are and, and a tribute to what you've done. And, and uh, you know, you're back at your alma mater. Uh, you've, you've been there before a couple times in, in development and senior leadership roles, but now as the director of athletics, and there's a storied history of athletic directors at Wake Forest, and you follow a guy who has a tremendous reputation in this industry, and the guy who kind of gave you your break at Wake Forest, and that's Ron Wellman. I can't start this podcast without, you know, kind of giving a shout out to Ron and allow you to kind of talk a little bit about his influence on your career. Ron Wellman really defined uh, professionalism and integrity uh, and excellence uh, to me when I started my career on August 16th, 1993. You know, one of the ironic things, Mike, is that a, a lot of uh, uh, interns or, or young assistant directors or whatever, they'll come up to me and say, um, you know, and, and I enjoy talking about career advancement and stuff like that with, with uh, younger uh, staff members, but they'll come up and say, hey, I want to be an AD someday, or, or they're, they're a senior and they're a student athlete. I want to be an AD like you someday. And in 1993, the concept of me looking at Ron Wellman, our athletics director, who was the relatively new athletic director at that time at Wake Forest, and me being like Ron Wellman, that wasn't in the realm of possibility for me. It wasn't even in the realm of my imagination. So I really salute the fact that uh, the new crop and the new leadership generation that's coming up has a lot more aspiration and imagination than I did at that age. That's for sure. You know, um, I do know that you were very active in circles there on campus, leadership roles and student government and your fraternity. And, and I think you and Ron met at an actually at a student event or something like that. And you, you asked some questions. He'd invite you to come by for a conversation. Yeah, it's a true story. So as a senior at Wake Forest, um, I was on the student government ticket committee and Ron Wellman was the relatively new. Well, he was the new. He started on, uh, I think, October 31st, 1992, which was the fall of my senior year. That was Rodney Rogers junior year at Wake Forest. Uh, that was the year Wake Forest won eight football games, uh, went to the Independence Bowl um, and eventually was in the Sweet 16 in basketball. The Joel Coliseum was four years old at that point. Student tickets were a big deal. And one of the things you learn later on is that the distribution of student tickets changes every two to four years as a new group of students complains and wants it changed. And it usually gets changed back to the way it was two years ago or four years ago, right? It's just a new way. Um, but Ron came to visit with this uh, uh, student government group, and he will joke that he was warned in advance that there was one student who was really fired up about this issue that he better be careful of. Uh, but afterwards, I was talking to Ron, and he said um, that I was talking to him about my um, what I was going to do after my uh, uh, graduation, which I really didn't know what it was. and uh, But I did talk about a couple things about how I thought the athletic uh, program could be more visible among students. And he said, well, come on by my office um, after the ACC tournament, as a matter of fact, and, and we'll talk about it some. And, and that led to an internship, um, eight-month internship at $832 a month, and which launched me into my career. 
That's awesome. You know, I want to talk specifically about your time back at Wake, and I actually I took a Photoshop of uh, a photo of something that one of your guys on campus said that I'm actually going to take the liberty to read for just a second from that article. Um, it, and it says this: It says Wake Forest athletics was chugging along nicely and doing well by all standards, academically and athletic, athletically. This is Peter Brubaker, by the way. Um, and he said, uh, let's see here. And then the bullet train came through the station and you were already late and you're grabbing on and you're trying to hold on. And he's referring to you in that quote as the bullet train. And I know in that article, you went on to say two words that you, you said define the time where Wake Forest is right now. And that's ascending and accelerating. Uh, you certainly, I know your energy personally from having worked with you. You've done a, a great job of, of, taking the unique characteristics of Wake Forest and applying them to the marketplace. Seven, seven FBS institutions in the state of North Carolina. What are you doing at the institution to try to make your play, make your mark, stand out among uh, the opportunities that are, that are there for you? Well, uh, I, I mean, I appreciate Pete Brubaker, who's our faculty athletic representative's uh, comments. Um, and it's, he's, he's been a great partner and we are getting a lot of things done. Uh, but I, but as you mentioned before, you know, Ron was the AD here for 27 years. And before that, Gene Hooks was the AD for 28 years, right? So you think about a place that had two athletic directors in 55 years, if I did my math right. Uh, what an incredible blessing for this institution. And one of the things I learned early on in my career, about a year or two in, I was a, a young assistant a, a director, and one of my uh, mentors came back from a meeting. And he had been with Ron, who was a relatively new athletic director back in the, in the early mid-90s at Wake. And someone in the department had responded to a request that Ron had made. And the response from this person was basically, well, I understand what you're asking, Ron, but you have to remember we're a small school with a small alumni base and we don't have many to blah, blah, and basically all these excuses, right? And Ron Wildman at the time told uh, my boss, it was Mike Thomas at the time, said, don't ever let one of your people say this ever again, right? <laughs> don't ever let that be our excuse. And I just tried to take that, um, what I learned from Ron, I had the same approach at Tennessee, I had the same approach at Kansas State, and we have the same approach here at Wake Forest. You know, we, we are not one of the larger enrollment schools in the country, uh, but we win ACC championships. We have, you know, 80% of our students attended football games this, this fall. Um, we graduated at a high level. Uh, we're performing well. We have I incredible facilities, thanks to Bob McCrary and Ben Sutton and Mitch Shaw and Alan Fox and lots of other people and Ron's vision and Dave Clawson's drive and our president's leadership. Uh, so we're, we're not going to we're not going to be slow down. We're, we're going to continue to move forward and uh, and continue to make our mark in the community. Yeah, and I, I'm going to come back to the to the the donor uh, interaction in just a minute, but I do want to I do want to call out you have been very consistent in your pu public forums talking about how you want the Wake Forest experience to be the best fan experience in the state of North Carolina. That's a bold statement, right? But I, but I know that. I know how you take notes during games and talk to your staff about uh, those things that you see afterwards and so forth. How do you define what it means to say the best fan experience in North Carolina? Well, well let me give you an example of how uh, meaningful feedback, right? You know, as, as our friend Bob O'Dean told me one time, the AD is never celebrated, only tolerated, right? Um, but I was out there before one of our games this year, uh, and one of our uh, parents of one of our football players who was a senior uh, came up to me and said, John, I just wanted to tell you, we've been here for five years and the experience for us as parents coming to a game and seeing all the energy around the stadium and seeing the activation. And it, this, this is incredible. This is so, this is so meaningful to us. Right. And so that goes back to core values of everything we do is about student athletes. But in fact, what we're doing is we're creating an environment for people to come together inside college athletics. So when we talk about Wake Forest having the best fan experience in North Carolina, you know, that's an aspirational goal, but it's also a mentality, right? And it's a mentality for everything we do. We're not going to make excuses. We're going to say things like this. Look, we have 30,000 people at our football stadium, right? We don't have 80,000. The good news is you don't have to wait in line for the bathroom with 80,000 people, right? We got great seats. It's intimate. The fans are, are engaged. Um, and we're going to do a lot of things to make this a great fan experience. 
we got great highway access in the state of North Carolina. There's 1.8 million people within uh, 30 minutes of our stadium. This is the third fastest state growing state, uh, state in the country. Uh, and we're going to leverage all those advantages to have a great experience for our fans right here at Truist Field, where I'm sitting today at McCrary Tower or across the street at Joel Coliseum. That's awesome. So one of the things that ADs are often measured on is, is hires, coaching hires specifically. Uh, obviously, your administrative hires matter too, but coaching hires gets the notoriety many times. And, you know, you can look at your career and, and all, every coach you've hired has had success. Uh, at Kansas State, Bruce Weber, you know, back to Tennessee, Tony Vitello, Chris Woodruff, uh, Steve Forbes at Wake, and I know there have been a number of other coaches. Talk to me a little bit about what you're – what you look for in coaches, what matters to you in coaches, what you think sets a, a successful coach apart from, from someone who might not have as the same level of success. Sure. Well, I, I guess every athletic director would start off talking about integrity and character, and, and those are those are givens, right? And the process to assess those things um, is really where a, an athletic director's value is shown in terms of relationships and um, and um, uh, uh, contacts and, and, and those kind of things. Uh, one of the most overlooked um, elements of success uh, from my perspective is intelligence. And there's many examples of, I think over time, I think it's gotten better and better because people have done a better job of, of grasping this, but the coaches we've hired, uh, whether it was Grant Robbins, who was our, our golf coach at Kansas State, who we hired, who brought Kansas State into the NCAA championships last year for the first time in 30 years and things like that. Um, or you, know, you mentioned Vitello, uh, those are all smart people, right? Our women's basketball coach right now is Megan Jebbia, uh, who we hired from American University. And the intentionality of everything she does um, and the way she ties it all together, the way she can communicate with multiple constituencies. Last Thursday night, we beat Louisville. First time we've ever beaten Louisville. The next morning at 930, she was in a committee me uh, meeting of our university board of trustees, and she just knocked it out of the park in that environment because she's smart and intentional about what she does and says. And I think those are really important characteristics. So part of having those coaches be successful is providing them with the right resources. And it's student athlete support, it's medical, nutritional, training, all those kind of things, obviously facilities. And we alluded to it a moment ago, you've got a, a, a group of, of, of folks who have really come alongside the university and said, hey, we're going to meet the mark in terms of what's expected to perform in the ACC and nationally. You mentioned three or four names, Mitt and Ben and, and uh, Bob and, and Alan. Uh, I know there are many, many more at Wake Forest that have, have contributed to the success. Um, but somebody has to step out, right? And those guys were stepping out, and that's really been a catalyst for so much of what you've done in your new facilities. Maybe speak into a little bit about the momentum around that and, and how you guys are aligned and trying to accomplish what's necessary for your coaches and your student athletes to have the resources to be successful. Well, you know, you and I both started our fundraising education at the heel of uh, foot of Charlie Patterson years ago and you know you go back to the five eyes right identify inform involve uh interest and invest i hope i said them in the right right order yeah. um uh, i think one of the things that's um we all reflect on in the development enterprise and as i as i say that i think about our, our great friend kirk goldbrand who passed away last week um is that these relationships that are created uh with donors become lifelong uh, really, really special relationships if you truly go into them uh, with the idea of finding out what's important to the contributor, what's important to the donor. And you go into it with the, the idea of, of, of really almost like, what can I provide as an athletics uh, director or as an athletics development director? What can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Donor, it's not about what we need. It's about what what do you want to see? What's your vision? You know, Bob McCrary, I'm sitting in Bob McCrary's suite uh, at McCrary Tower. And Bob McCrary is a quintessential uh, example of everything that has ever happened good in college athletics. I mean, he literally came to Wake Forest on a football scholarship in 1956 uh, from a, a, a home in Western North Carolina that had no indoor plumbing, right? And now he has given over $55 million uh, to Wake Forest athletics, most of it for Wake Forest football, because he wants um, our student athletes to have an incredible experience. He recognizes the impact it has on our community, uh, and he wants to win, right? Those are all good things. He's a great American and a great Wake Forester, um, but 
they've done a great job at Wake Forest going back to the original uh, group of athletic fundraisers of engaging with Bob. There were people at Wake Forest that invested in Bob, whether it was our old trainer, Doc Martin or whoever, you know, Barry Faircloth's uh, work with Bob, but also having that group of lead donors really engaged in going around like they did long before I was here, you know, 10 years ago, going around and looking around the country at, at the things that other people were doing and building a vision of what could be done at Wake Forest. Uh, and now, as we say, you know, we want to be the place that people are coming to see what we're doing. And they are. And they're really impressed uh, at the things that the people like Bob McCrary and Ben Sutton uh, and others have made possible. You know, one of the, the unique stories I've found about your time raising dollars and working with donors. And yeah, I think I mentioned to you this. Chad Weiberg mentioned uh, this when, when I interviewed him uh, a, a couple months ago, uh, talking about the, the friend that you guys uh, made at Kansas State, who part of the Part of the development process, if you will, was actually taking uh, this gentleman to Europe and touring World War II battlefields. So, uh, you know, speak to that a little bit, if you would, too. Well, that was a incredibly, I'm so proud of everything that has happened at Kansas State. And obviously, Gene Taylor's done an incredible job of uh, propelling them uh, to where they are now. But, uh, you know, when we first got there in 2009, uh, as the brand new athletics director, uh, it was a pretty tough situation. There were a lot of challenges. Obviously, it was a recession. Uh, there were fiscal issues. Uh, but there were people like Chad Weinberg who had been there, who had built great relationships uh, with the donors there. And as they looked for answers to the questions they had, uh, you know, we just aspired to be very um, transparent. Uh, you're talking about Jack Veneer. Um, and, and, and Jack was kind of the donor at, at Kansas State that everybody went to for everything, right? And when we went to see Jack and his son, John, who remains, uh, both of them remain great friends, and John is a, especially a close friend, um, Jack kind of looked at us and said, I've done everything. You got to get some other people to do stuff, right? And that became our calling card. For the next two or three years, we didn't ask Mr. Veneer for anything, but we would take the list to show them all the people who had made commitments to the new basketball practice facility or to the new uh, football complex or whatever it was. And, and the fun part of that is when he started not recognizing the names and he started yeah. seeing that we were bringing other people in. And eventually in 2014, um, the Veneer family uh, made a $60 million gift. It was the largest gift in the history of the university. And what was really cool about that gift is 20 million went for the new football complex, the Veneer football complex, 40 million went to academic initiatives just like that 50 million dollar gift that that we that we were that we were a small part of at tennessee in 2008 where 25 went for athletics and 25 went for academic initiatives uh, and so those have been great uh relationships that that remain uh to this day and a great example of of people choosing to be uh, uh real leaders in a university community yeah I'm, I'm glad you brought up the gift at tennessee because you and i were fortunate enough to be a part of that uh, then at the time, that was the largest gift in the history of the of University of Tennessee as well. And the thing that I think is the story of that, and I, and I give you credit for, for leading this effort, was how you, in such a um, significant way, making sure that we understood the donors' needs, wants, desires, interests, and then taking that across campus and formulating the right, the right ask for, for the benefit of the institution at the end of the day. And, and as you know, John, I mean, so many times there's this I'll call it competition in some ways where universities development folks are a little skeptical of the athletic development folks and the athletic development folks are saying they never let us call on any of the major alumni, uh, potential donors, et cetera, et cetera. But that really, that really um, formed a bridge candidly with the, the university development office and our athletic department and it led to some other se seeming, you know, large uh, financial gifts for the benefit of the institution. And so, Talk a little bit about the importance of that and what you learned from, you obviously learned from that. You took that and you, you applied it at Kansas State. I know you're applying it at Wake Forest now, but uh, that's something that's been important to you during your career. Well, you know, we have five core values uh, that we talk about. The third value is, is, is literally value to Wake Forest, Winston-Salem, and the Triad community. Now, that was tweaked a little bit when we were at Tennessee. It was tweaked when we were at Kansas State. Um, a little bit, but it's basically the idea that in athletics, uh, we, you know, obviously our first value is a world-class student athlete experience. That's where it all starts, right? And then value number two is integrity and a bunch of different areas. Um, so we're all about the student athlete experience, but, but we also exist to serve uh, our university, just like any other unit of the university exists to serve the greater 
uh, university. And sometimes it's hard. Uh, and certainly I remember when I first came to Tennessee uh, with you and Mitch back in 1998, sometimes it was hard for people to really believe that that's what you really meant, right? <laughs> that we really are here to serve uh, the university. And so you, you kind of have to overdo it. I remember Jay Jacobs when he was uh, um, working uh, at uh, Auburn before he was the uh, athletic director. He used to have the athletic fundraisers. Anytime they made an ask, they always made a university ask before they made their athletic ask, even if it was, you know, a thousand dollars for the college fund or whatever to demonstrate uh, beyond maybe the stereotypes of athletics being solely about athletics. Here at Wake Forest, we don't even use the term athletic department. We're Wake Forest athletics. We're not Wake Forest athletic department across the street or down the hill or whatever. We're Wake Forest athletics. And, um, and we, we say that over and over again to to really uh, break down some of the silos or the territorial mentality that probably we created over time. And it just takes a long time to build uh, to, to bring that back. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we're working on some really uh, overall we're working on some really exciting uh, stuff around um, uh, that are that are really whole university initiatives um, that somehow that do touch some athletic facilities but I was giving a presentation to the board about it at the regular board meeting, not in the athletics committee meeting, but in the board meeting. And one of our trustees came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I, I didn't, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're talking about university initiatives, not just athletic initiatives. And, you know, it wasn't like rocket science or anything like that, <laughs> but guess what? Athletics is more appreciated um, because you have that kind of approach uh, and it might help, you get things done that you need to get done for athletics so athletics can manu uh, maximize its value to the entire u university. Yeah. So you are a goal-oriented, driven, type A personality guy that has served you well. You had a few months, not a long time, but you had a few months where you stepped away from being on campus between your time at Tennessee and, and then your opportunity to be the athletic director at Wake Forest. Um, that was time to reflect. Um, I'm curious what you learned during those months. What, what did you learn about yourself? Did you ever contemplate leaving college athletics? Uh, maybe give us some insight. Well, I, I would say the first thing is that I always felt like um, I wasn't just about college athletics, right? I, I could be, I could do other things. I could be involved in other entities. You know, like I said at the very beginning, I never, I didn't start out my career saying I want to be an athletic director someday. Although that became a, a goal and uh, something I thought I could be uh, constructive uh, to others by doing. Um, when you, when you're going 100 miles an hour and everything's up, 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 and all of a sudden, boom, there's an interruption that's quite unexpected. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's really disorienting. And I was really fortunate. I had a great uh, support from family and friends, et cetera. Um, I would tell you that, you know, right after that, um, I was with my family for the most part for about four or five weeks. Every day I, I was with my family or maybe I was with my daughter on a trip or, or whatever. Right. And then after about five or six weeks, and that was over the Christmas holidays, et cetera, um, I went to the college football playoff game down in Atlanta. And I was away from my family for about four days. And I realized how desensitized I had become over my career to being mm -hmm. away from my family. You know, for all those years, I can't remember what it was, 25 years or something. At that point, it was nine years as an AD. You know, and, and as you know, we, the, we you, you, as Charlie used to say, we don't, the postman does not do a good job of raising the mail, right? You get, you're raising the money. You got to go get the money. And, and I realized how much I missed my family and how, boy, all these years when I was on the road, I didn't really miss my family because I desensitized myself to that, right? Which is really not a very healthy thing to think about, okay? So I think that was a good, a, a good uh, lesson. Um, as I went along, and, and I was really fortunate, I had an opportunity, uh, uh, Chris Howard called me and asked me to come up and and be an executive in residence at Robert Morris University in the business school for a week. And then um, uh, I became affiliated with Columbia uh, University as an adjunct professor in sports management. And I've taught that class five years in a row now. Um, I, I did some consulting um, on a couple of different projects. I did a bunch of stuff down in Texas for, oh, I don't know, six or eight or nine months. But one of the things that became really clear to me is that I love being part of a team. And I don't have to be the leader of the team, but I want to be on a team. 
And I remember Coach Dickey, um, you know, who's still going strong at age 90-something, I remember him saying to me one time that, you know, there's something special about being part of a team and working towards a team goal. And so I appreciate people who can be um, – independent, all that kind of stuff. But I'm a team guy. I love being a part of a team, team goals, um, understanding what the president's um, goals are and trying to figure out how I can help with those goals. I love being part of a team. And I'm really lucky that President Hatch um, and the board gave me the opportunity to rejoin the Wake Forest team. Oh, I'm glad they did too, John. Um, we both understand and know the power of relationships. And I know you have a, a small group of guys that uh, – fellow athletic director is that you guys uh, get together occasionally and talk about things, uh, personal lives and professional lives. And, and then I also know that you value uh, mentors, mentors and, and being mentored, but being serving as a mentor, um, the role of relationships, both with peers and others in your life. Uh, talk about the importance of that, if you would. Well, the relationships mean everything, right? And um, I'm really lucky that I was, um, Sometimes, I, and I, I kind of said that on that Wake Forest article, you know, that first group that I worked for, um, I was just lucky that I had people that cared um, as much as about my goals as I did. And in, in fact, people that, like that believed in things that I didn't know I could do. Right. And I'm really I mean, that's like providential that I was in those kind of situations, you know, starting out at the very beginning. Uh, with, I mentioned like Charlie and, and uh, Griffin and Mike Thomas and Ron, um, you know, you at Tennessee. I mean, I can remember those days. Uh, you know, I often joke, you know, I think I interviewed for seven or eight AD jobs before I got the K-State job. And, and every job was better than the last one I'd gotten rejected for. Um, and there were moments in time that I know you believed I could do it. You know, even in some moments when I maybe had some doubts that I could actually do it. Um, and then I've had great presidential mentors. Um, and then, you know, we get a real special opportunity uh, in these kind of roles uh, to be around incredible leaders and to be able to soak up from these incredible leaders, you know, how they've done their thing. Um, and I've been really blessed in that regard. Mm. All right. So one question, and then we're going to do a speed round. Okay. So the, the last question, if you would, is obviously you've had familiarity with Jim Phillips uh, for a long time uh, from time Tennessee, and you, know, you guys that work directly together, you share that. And then as a fellow athletic director, and now he's the commissioner of the Atlantic Coast Conference, uh, I'd just like to hear how you've how you've experienced him as a commissioner and what you see him doing to help Wake Forest and other Atlantic Coast Conference institutions. Well, Commissioner Phillips has done an incredible job, and you know one of the things that that you saw with him coming in is he came in with a blueprint, you know, just like an athletic director would have coming into uh, a new university, and within you know. Two days, I think, he had talked to every athletics director. He had talked to every president. He had talked to every faculty athletic rep. You know, he had talked to all the football coaches. I mean, he was just really methodical about uh, and intentional about establishing some basis of relationship right away. And this enterprise uh, is too crazy to not have relationships. It, it won't work without relationships. And there's too many you know, question marks and arrows coming from the outside and all that kind of stuff to not have relationships with people. And without that, you can't have any trust. And so that would be the first thing that Jim did right away. And he's continued to be um, a great listener. He's continued to be thoughtful and strategic. Um, he has uh, uh, built a really good uh, relationship with all the governance groups, with the coaches, et cetera. Uh, and I really appreciate the way he's led our conference into a really strong position. That's awesome. Uh, all right, so speed round. These are, you can answer in one word, you can answer in a couple of comments. These are layups, okay? First of all, what's for uh, for those who don't know, what's a demon deacon? <laughs> well, Wake Forest was the Tigers at one point, actually, with deference to Clemson. But, uh, you know, Wake Forest Baptist heritage, and so the, the deacon is a leadership person in a local Baptist church. Um, maybe or not, it, it was a play off the Blue Devils or whatever, but the demon deacon uh, is our mascot. That's awesome. Okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. Best barbecue in the state of North Carolina? Um, well, right here in Winston-Salem. Uh, you Right off of Business 85. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I know you have, an, you have a love for Germany. Why Germany? <laughs> uh, well, I took German at Wake Forest. And uh, I, over five semesters, I passed four semesters. 
Um, and then I had a really special opportunity between my sophomore and junior year uh, to, to be in four cities uh, for four weeks with a, a, a German professor uh, from Wake Forest. And so I, I've enjoyed knowing a little bit of the language uh, to be able to get around a little bit. It was something I shared with my father uh, as well. You're a student of World War II history. What, what's the genesis of that? My grandfather, Farnham Gray, uh, came ashore at Utah Beach uh, with the 8th Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division at 6.30 a.m. on June 6, 1944. And so as a kid, um, I was enthralled with the medals on the wall, and he had his Service 45 that was hit by a shell, so it was bent like a banana. Uh, and I read all the books about uh, World War II and Estes Hills Elementary School, and that's continued to be an area of great interest um, uh, throughout my life. Mm. Favorite ski resort? Alta. Alta, Utah. okay. Little Cottonwood Montre Canyon. Go ahead. What'd you say? I said Alta. Little Cottonwood Alta. Canyon. Okay. Utah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Montreat or Debido? Montreat. Love the mountains, Debedu right? Debido for a second. Yeah. Love the mountains. Um, yeah, so all right, John, we're, uh, we're going to wrap up here in just a second. I'm curious, as you look out on the landscape for college athletics, you know, there's a lot of chatter, right, right now with everything that college athletics is, is facing, and, and it's going to take leadership, strong leadership to get through all that. There, there's been chatter before, right? There's been chatter before. And um, so, but strong leadership has gotten us through those times and we've got a new NCAA president. Maybe take a step back for just a second and, and think about what do you feel like are the, the key things that college athletics needs to be mindful of as we continue to walk through all that we're experiencing right now and, and under the new president and otherwise over these next six to 12 months? Well, that's not a wrap it up question. That's like four hours <laughs> of like oration. That wasn't a speed round question. I, I, I do feel very strongly that all of us, depending on our position, have to control what we can control. And in reality, athletic directors really don't control anything. We manage a lot of stuff, but we don't control anything. Um, what I can control is, is why I do this. And I do this uh, for our university. And I do this for the other day when we took a tour of the um, soon to be opened a uh, McCrary uh, football complex, which is a, um, a $38 million addition to our indoor field. And I walked out of the tour, took off my helmet, and there were a bunch of our players, uh, student athletes that were getting done with their workout. Guys like Chase Jones, who's a finance major, starting linebacker, and Michael Jurgens, uh, and Devontae Gordon. And just being around those guys and seeing how appreciative they are for the opportunities they have. And yeah, it's not easy. And everybody would like more money from this or that. But Generally speaking, if you're not feeling good about yourself in this business or in this enterprise, I, used, I like to say, go just hang out with some student athletes and see um, what, how the opportunities they have. Uh, it truly is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's truly an, an, an opportunity that, that all kinds of people would love to have. And don't lose sight of the fact that it is a special opportunity uh, that, that, that we create. And the, the, um, the symbiotic nature of what student athletes do for higher education and do for our communities is huge as well. So don't give up on the principle that what this is isn't a really good thing. Mm, that's a good, good thing to end on. Hey, so here's the deal. Uh, in the early, I'm sorry, mid-90s, we had the opportunity to have you come and run our annual fund at Tennessee. You did that very well. And then you and I, over a, a sweet tea or a Diet Coke or something, met at a Cracker Barrel in Inca Candler a few years later, and, and uh, we were able to, to get you back to Tennessee after you had gone to Wake. And the, the nine or so years that you and I worked together are, are some of the best memories of my career, and I know that we did a lot together. I mean, it's, it's really good when you're in a leadership position to have people alongside you that you trust, that you know will challenge your thought processes, uh, that will go into the hard places and do the hard things, and somebody that you can celebrate the great wins with and also, you know, uh, bemoan the losses and commiserate about the losses. And fortunately, John, you and I were able to experience a whole lot more of the highs than the lows. And, and so just in this public forum, I want to say thank you for, for all of that in terms of the things that we've been able to do together. You know how much I think of you personally and as a friend and colleague. And, and so I want to acknowledge the professional side of that, too. And, and thank you for joining me today. Mike, I appreciate it. As Coach Dick, you say, you know, athletics is high highs and low lows. And I just look back at my career. Um, I've had, you know, there's kind of magical moments or magical periods that are created. Um, and there's also tough slog times, right? 
and I've had more than my share of magical runs. Uh, and that run uh, at Tennessee um, was real is one of those really really special runs that I'm grateful for, and I'm grateful uh, that you gave me a chance twice uh, to be part of it. <laughs> Uh, no doubt, man. It paid off both times. Greg Byrne, by the way, still calls out the first one since it was he, he likes to tell people that it was between the two of you and I made the decision to go your route. And I think I think it all turned out well for all of us. Right. So well, um, I'm just glad you're a New Testament guy uh, that <laughs> believes in grace and forgiveness and you forgave me. So thank you. Oh, uh, no doubt. All right, folks, you've been listening from the chair. I'm your host, Mike Hamilton. We're right here every week. You can. As, uh, as you may know, we now have 60-something episodes for you to watch or listen to. YouTube is where you watch it, and all your audio platforms is where you listen to it. My special guest today, the athletic director at Wake Forest University, dear friend John Curry. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.